of course to talk about the rest of the football now is John Myler. John, how are you doing? Morning, Shane. I feel I, I can talk football as well, Shane. Can you? <laughs> I, I, yeah, we won the All Ireland Club in 1987. Oh, Shane, you don't know your history. You, you don't, don't know, know your history. history. <laughs> yeah, okay, look, look, it's early in the morning, John. Don't be too hard on me. That's disappointing, you know, Shane. You didn't know that. I played football for Wexford as well, so, you know. Uh, yeah, um, well, t do you actually pay much attention to the, the inter county football these days? I love going to the football. I, I, you know, down through the years here in Cork, I always love going to watch Nemo Rangers or the Bars play football, Cassidhaven as well. but I love Dublin and, um, you know, and I love watching the Kerry footballers as well when they go at it. But what drives me bonkers is is when they start playing around with the ball in the half-back line and there's no attackers or anybody's 15 behind the ball. I, 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 that's terrible, really. It's very Hurling poor entertainment. Hurling is heading that way. Yeah, but, you know, you can put a ball over the bar from 120 yards now, so you can cut that out, you know what I mean? And if you get a goal, then you have to come out, you know what I mean? The game could be over quickly, but, you know, games adapt, and that's really it. Do you know, a couple of years ago, I was reading, it seems you mentioned uh, back in the 80s and stuff, playing football. I read um, Larry Tompkins' autobiography, and he was talking about playing with Castlehaven and so on. Would you have come up against him directly? Yeah, yeah. The Castlehaven and the bars in the 80s were... They were torrid the fair, Shane, um, down in Clannacilty or down in Bandon, Jesus. And you had the Collinses, Christy Collins, Francie Collins, all those, uh, Donald Collins, they all played with Castlehaven and they played hurling with Black Rock as well. And uh, Niles Cahillan, and Jesus, they, they were tough matches now on a Friday night or a Saturday night in Bandon or uh, Clannacilty. Um, being for blood when, when the bars came down, <laughs> Jesus. Um, they were tough. They were tough matches, and I tell you that. Um, Mark and um, Danny, Dinny Collins, I think, on the edge of the square. I was full back in football, but uh, Christ, um, you know, you earned your cross there. <laughs> yeah, Michael? No, Eamon O'Hara was talking there, John, about uh, Ray Silk pulling his finger. I'd say there was a lot more pulling and swinging going on when he played Castlehaven than that. <laughs> yeah, no, it, 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 it was, they were torrid matches. They were tough men. Um, you know, really hard matches, no down there and then of course County Ward would always put us down in in, in Clan or down in Bandon like and uh, I, I remember one game against Bandon in um against Castlehaven in Bandon and then JBM got a fantastic goal that night. You know I mean they, they were they were great matches and um I remember there one day Seamus Looney, Lord of Mercy on him he, he was a barrist he was the barrist doctor who played hurling and football for Cork. But, um, you know, he used to do the warm up before matches and he was breaking umbrellas and everything. And, you know, rainy day in that. <laughs> ah, yeah. They were good days, Shane. <laughs> do, there's a question here from Taloman GEA. Now, you, ha you, you were uh, front and centre on the TV coverage last week, John. I don't know if you know about this, but how did you get on in the terrace last week? Well, it was a fantastic view of the game. Um, fantastic view of the game and uh, just watching the you know especially in the first half say or especially before the game i watched the waterford warm-up shane and i said jesus you know they'll be finished before the game ever starts and they were running and sprinting and ball work at a 300 miles an hour and i said they won't they won't start you know they were completely flat when they started and you also get a fantastic view of you know puck outs and you know, the, the Waterford wing back was on one side of the field, things like that that you wouldn't see from the middle of the pitch. And um, but the the Waterford warm up shame before the game ever started was was crazy. I think you know what I mean. Um, absolutely crazy. Were you always conscious of that as a manager, John? Like I don't know. I think you do your activation work and you do your bits and pieces to get out in the pitch. I don't know. I fifteen or twenty minutes to me on a on a sweltering hot but, day is enough. What do you, like? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, like you, you really have to judge that. And I watched that the minute the Camogie match was over on Sunday, Waterford were out on the field pucking around at you know at half two. And most guys come now to matches; they're already probably had a rub in the hotel. They've already been strapped up. And then when you go back into the dressing room at three o'clock, like what do you do? Um, so you know, and I've asked my own young fella, like the, in the Premier League, when they were they had to be there an hour and a half before a game. So what, how do you fill your time? And he often said he brought a book with him to read it inside in the dressing room, just to stay calm. And I always said it to him. I said, you need to play the match at four o'clock, not at two o'clock or half two. And and you know, I thought Wadford were actually burned out before they ever started for that reason. And um, 
you know, you kind of have to manage the time and just to get the warm up right. You, you don't overexert. You don't overexert before the game. Just got to get right, and then when it, when the throw in comes at four o'clock, then you have to play. Is that yeah. something you learn from experience, John, in terms of like the warm up and getting it wrong at certain points and then yeah. adjusting? Yeah, you you go back and you look at matches, and say what did we do wrong or what did we do right, and um, you know what I mean that um, we overdone the talking before in the hotel. We overdid this, and guys are coming at three o'clock into a, a dressing room set up. And what do they do? They're ready to go. So you have to kind of manage that and, and just tone it down until four o'clock. And there's very little to be said. There's very little to be said nowadays compared to my time, you know, where you probably just met up in the hotel, had a cup of tea and a sandwich and then just went to the match. Whereas nowadays that, that you know, fellas are meeting in the Rochestown Park Hotel at one o'clock and you have your, your um, you know, whatever you're having there, your chicken salad, whatever. And, you know, you get the bus down, the guard um, and police escort down. And, you know, there's very little talking to be done. You, you should do your talking, you know, in the in the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday before the game. Um, and, and, and that's really it, you know. Mm, you were speaking about a tired affairs with Castlehaven. I presume you're expecting a fairly tired affair between Cork and Tip this weekend. It won't be simple, I'd say. And it's... Uh, it's no, a but, brilliant game to look forward to. Yes, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. I really enjoyed um, the, the first couple of games so far. Look, it's it, you know the word torrid was probably better referred to my time in the eighties. I I think that the hurling now is, is is speed, skill. You know, really, really good points. Hoggy got one point last Sunday. You know, I mean, from a tight angle, it's, you know, a fantastic score. And you'll see that you now with tip on um, tip on Sunday as well. So look, it's going to be hard really really contested game because both teams have two points both teams will really want to win their second game and I think this is Cox you know second home game they'll have two away games so it's going to be you know they need to have four points in the bag because I think Waterford are gone you know they've played two and they have a scoring difference of minus nine now the scoring difference is going to come in here and um, the scoring difference is going to come in here at the end and and, and you remember Galway from Correct me if I'm wrong. I 19, think three years, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, three years ago, they were caught. They were caught with scoring difference. Um, and and uh, there's no team wants to be caught. And Cork's last game is Limerick in Limerick. So you know you need to get your points on the board as quickly as possible because you'll have maybe one poor game out of the four, or or maybe two. But you you you, it's how well you play when you're playing badly in these four matches together and. Uh, Cock need to win this. Tipperary need to win this game on on on, sun, on Saturday night. John, go back to last year when Cork went to Thurles and they were behind early on. Tipperary had a penalty. Looked like they could end up steamroller on Cork. Then ultimately the Rebels won by 12 points, like battered Tipperary and that was the end of Colin Bonner, really. I mean, it's it's been quite a change in the meantime, but that was a big win for Cork in the sense of, of being able to lay down a marker on Tipperary. Yeah, but I, I think there's a big win for Cork. But Cork will always play well in Turles and playing Tipperary, you know, I mean, again here on on on, um, on Saturday night. But Cal has come in, Shane, and, and he's brought that enthusiasm. He's won two All-Ireland under-20s with Tip. So he'll know most of these guys, Garota, Connor, all these fellas, and Jake Morris. And he's won with them, and they've won with him. And that's the trust that you get if, if you win with a manager. So, look, it's, it's going to be competitive on Saturday. It's really going to be competitive. Uh, Pat Ryan has won two under-20 All-Irelands. Cal won the previous two under-20 All-Irelands. So there's a lot to play for here, and it's going to be really, really well contested. Just on that, John, it's actually interesting you mentioned because there's a lot of similarities between Pat Ryan and Liam Cal, and we're actually chatting to, to both of them at the, the launch of the Dylan Kirk Foundation uh, fundraising drive the other day. And I thought it was interesting some of the stuff Pat was saying. Um, so he knows, you know, the caliber of the young fellas there, and he trusts them. They trust yeah, them all because yeah. they've seen them yeah. all. So yeah. he was kind of almost saying that there's a little bit of a fear factor there with the older players now that they know what that they have to step up. That Pat and the lads will just throw in these younger lads. They trust them, and he kind of the one thing he keeps coming back to over and over and over again: if you don't work, you will not wear a Cork jersey. And I think it's just interesting that. He, the lads know that he will throw these new faces in. He'll throw a Brian Roach in or he'll throw whoever else in, yeah, Owen Downey or whoever. 
Yeah, but those guys are 23, bro. Um, the Roaches were with me at under 15, under 16. That's going back to 2015 and 16. Tommy O'Connell as well. So you, you've really good pedigree in the two Roaches and, and Tommy O'Connell. There's really, really good pedigree there. And Pat will put him in because he's won two under 20. The same with Carl will throw in Jake Morris and those fellas that maybe Bonner didn't throw in uh, last year and the previous year. So it's it, there's a trust between the player and the manager in both setups with the younger players. And Pat knows what he'll get from Roach, from Downey, from Tommy O'Connell, all those as well as Carl will know. So they're equal on that terms. And, and you know, that's what will come to the fore on, on, um, on Sunday or on Saturday night. But I, I give over this thing of work with Cork. Cork have players in, now they have fresher, newer players in. The older guys, you know, Hoggy, Seamus, Lahan are, 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 you know, over 30 you now. And um, he's young legs in there and they will work. Those guys will work. That's a fact. Do you know, like Tommy O'Connell had a difficult start last week. He had a couple of balls, I think, caught yeah. over him by Jack Prendergast, but settled yeah. down as well. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, do you see him starting again? Do you see Owen Downey been drafted in? If you know, look, they could really jig the 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 team any way they like. But how do you see the starting team? No, I, I I thought Tommy was in trouble early on in the first half. Over in in um, as I looked at it on the left hand side in the, in front of the stand, he was in trouble. But he settled into the game. And there's one thing about Tommy. He's a really, really good distributor of the ball. Really, really technically very good. Played centre back with Middleton as well, you know, when they won the county two years ago here. So, you know, he'll hold on there. Downey hasn't played for a while. Um, you know, so Pat may make changes, but he might stick to the same team as well because, you know, they won the last day. Just put him out again. Let's see what we got. No, he has. You know, Robbie O'Flynn came on, Shane Kingston came on, Conor Cahillan came on, um, Downey, Owen Downey should be back. So he, he has options that are that are viable on the sideline. And, you know, he has 20 players now, and you really need those five, six, seven impact subs. And they made a difference when they come on um, the last day. Robbie came on, he got two points, and it was good to see him after his injury. So, you know, I think Cork have... You know, fellas that come up, but they have to make an impact. No, that's critical. It's you know, it's interesting. Like the two teams that um, that that were beaten by Cork and uh, Tipperary, so Clare and Waterford, they both performed really, really well against Limerick. But at the same time, we don't know were Tip that brilliant against Clare, were Waterford uh, that poor against Cork. It's it's actually hard to know, to get a true read on the form right, of these yeah. teams, John, until this weekend. Yeah, but you all, everybody wants to cut off Limerick because, you know, they're going for four in a row and, and things like that. So, you know, you raise your game for Limerick and that. But uh, look, it's, it's you you know Munster Championship games as well as I do. Like, they're really, really competitive and it's on the day that really matters. Uh, now, I just thought Waterford were very poor, but I would... You know, say that Cork started really, really well last Sunday, and Fitzy came in. He got three points in the first five minutes, settled Cork, and then Cork got one or two more points on the board. So Cork got a really good settling in, and you know the, the game was more open than what I thought it would be. I thought it would be more tighter game. I thought Waterford would have been tighter, but they weren't. And like Fitzy, with that five minutes, settled Cork down, and I think Cork hurled in the way they can hold them. Mm. Okay, well, we've also got joining us now, uh, Declan Ryan, uh, multiple All-Ireland winner with Tipperary. Declan, I think you might have... Or how are you this morning? Can you hear us okay? Very good, thanks, Sam. Great to have you on. Uh, I suppose to start off, you, you're, you're joining us basically talking about the Dylan Quirk Foundation and the drive to, I suppose, raise enough money to ensure that there are, you know, monitors for heart conditions and stuff like that with GA players across the country. So can you just talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, we had, a, we had a great launch there on Tuesday morning in Clannolty Rossmore GA pitch, now called the Dylan Quirk GA grounds. Uh, we in attendance were all the, the managers around, um, the, the inter-county managers, uh, former president Sean Kelly was there, MEP, and uh, we had a great attendance from our own local school. Uh, basically, I suppose it's, it's, it's a day for Dylan in Killarney in October, the... GAA All Ireland Golf Challenge have been very good to give us a number of slots in Killarney there on the 20th of October, and there'll be a number of uh, celebrities playing golf down there. 
and uh, people will be hopefully paying into the foundation. Uh, we hope to raise about a hundred thousand. That's the, that's the goal anyway on the day, Shane. So I suppose um, just as regards the foundation, we we as parents we we'd all like to have in to be able to make informed decisions about our children's participation in sport and cardio screening will allow that. Um, you know, there, there are about 100 young people every year die from sudden adult death syndrome, which is far too many. And as we know, information is power. And if we had um, more information available, you know, we'd probably make better decisions. Mm, and in, the response has been brilliant, hasn't it? The response has been great. Um, people have been very, very generous. Of course, it, it, it has impacted us all in the GAA world. Uh, you know, now we, we did a lovely mural for, for Dylan there. Neil O'Dwyer did it there in in the grounds in Flanolty. And, um, you know, to see all the young kids coming in there on Tuesday morning from the local national schools there was, you know, it had, it had a major impact. But people have been very good. Um, I suppose the GA family at grassroots level are, are um, extremely generous. And um, I think Dylan's passing has impacted us all. He's the only hurling player to die on the field of play. And I think that is, has hit us very hard, obviously, in our own community. Dan and Hazel, his mum and dad there, um, Shannon and Kelly, his two sisters, but also his wider family and community and uh, the GA world have been, it has, it has impacted greatly. Mm, absolutely, no doubt. Uh, John, this is something that across the country is just a, a hugely important um, thing going forward. Yeah, I, I think that all players, you know, should be screened uh, from a cardiac point of view. It's, it's, it's really critical. Um, I remember going back a few years ago, there was a company here in Cork and in, in the college, Heart Aid, and they were doing cardiac screening. Um, I can't think of his name now, Aid from Douglas here. I can't think of his second name, but they were doing cardiac screening. And, you know what I mean? It, it, it should be really mandatory. It's like the defib defibrillators that are on the wall of most GA clubs now. Um, you know, these things are mandatory, really, and, and you have to have it in place. You know, all clubs, all players should be really screened and tested. Mm. Uh, on that, Shane, I was actually yeah. I was down in Clenolty, uh on on uh, on Tuesday. It's fantastic. It was a fantastic occasion, and it was a celebrate a spe celebration of, of Dylan Cork's yeah. life. And just as it would encourage everybody, I think they're they're asking clubs to donate a hundred euro to the every club to donate a hundred euro to the foundation. And my own club will be doing that. And I encourage everybody that's involved that's watching that's involved with a different club to talk to your executive and, and make sure that that donation is made because it's going to the the best of causes to make sure that. Uh, every GA player over the age of twelve is uh, has basically the availability or the access to a cardiac screening, and uh, it's just hugely important to to hopefully prevent something like this happening again in the future. But right. but it should, Michael, it should be put into the clubs itself that that the club should screen. You know, yeah, the club should screen players and and um, make that compulsory, like from a from a medical from a safety point of view. Definitely, yeah. I think I think part of the the foundations. Uh, goal will be that they will actually go to clubs and right. help clubs to, yeah. to yeah. offer that facility which would be great for them yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think i think what we must realize is any any of us that are involved in managing teams at club or inter-county level you know we, we don't have any idea of the, the family history uh, or any of the medical issues that the players under your care might have so um cardio screening would would show up any any little faults that might be underlying there and uh, you know the parents could take it from there but the more information we have about the health of our children and our young GA players the better. Mm, absolutely. Declan just before you came on we, we were talking a little bit about Tipperary and Cork this weekend. What's your thoughts on this game and how it might go? Yeah I was down to see Tip playing in Ennis there. Um, I didn't see the Cork game at the weekend but um, I think yeah, from a Tipperary point of view, it's a great game for Tip, um, played in a, in a great stadium. I think Clem has his men going very well in Tip here. They're, they play, they reflect his own personality, I suppose. They're energetic and they're fit. And they're playing with, um, they're playing with a lot of um, cohesion. But it'll be a big test, and I think it's a big test for Cork as well. Uh, Cork are probably a little bit unknown. Um, obviously, I've always had great regard for Pat Horgan as a hurler. 
Uh, Conor Lehan is is a man that when he's when he's on fire, he's very difficult to handle. Uh, but I think for Pat Ryan, Pat Ryan was very good to attend there on Tuesday. <clears throat> um, Pat Ryan is a very honest and decent uh, manager, and I think that both teams will reflect their their managers on the day anyway. And it should be a very interesting uh, Munster Championship game. Are there any games in particular, Declan, that stick out to you in when in terms of your own playing days with Tipperary against Cork? Uh, we had a lot of great, a lot of great, and some very tough games against Cork over the years. And um, you know, Cork always had very, um, they always had big players. You know, a lot of them were six foot plus, which was, it mightn't by Limerick standards today, them that mightn't be huge, but Cork were always, um, you know, they they always had Mark Foley, for example, Ger Fitzgerald, uh, Tomas Mulcahy. Uh, these were all all fine big um, men that were well able to play the game of Holland as well. I suppose Limerick have brought that to a new level now, but um, I think there's a, I think there'll, there'll be great atmosphere in Cork at the weekend, and um, I think it could be a wide open game. There could be lots of goals in it, um, and it'll be interesting to see how it goes. Anyhow, yeah, John, like if you look at last week, the, my father was saying to me, "Geez, Cork, if they scoring those points against Tipperary, we're in trouble." And I said, "But there's no way Tipperary would miss all these goal chances." So, um, like, is Ratton that as a Cork person, well? From the Cork side, you're obviously a Wexford man as well. That you'd be concerned about in with regards to Tip. Well, I thought you know I I the bird's eye view in the Black Rock end of that Waterford had got in four or five times for goal chances. Now I, I noticed that the 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 Cork backs kind of converged on the big square, um, and you know Damien made a couple of interceptions and Pam made a couple of good saves and goals. So look, those opportunities arose for Waterford last last Sunday, but. They didn't take them. You have to take your opportunities. All very well saying Cork coughed up four or five chances for Waterford, but Waterford didn't score them. And Cork will look at that during the week and tighten up on that. Um, so, you know, Tip, tip uh, coughed up a few scores against Clare as well. Um, so, you know, the, the Corner Farrell got two goals. I can't think of his name, McCarthy, I think, got two goals for Clare. So there are opportunities possibly at both ends. Um, and just to tighten, I think both sides will look at their respective matches uh, from last week and tighten up on, on areas. So I, ex- I don't think it'll be as open as what Declan is saying. There, it, it'll be, it'll be hard. It'll be competitive, um, and as he's saying it'll reflect uh, both managers' ideologies. Really, it's a huge game for both. Shane, realistically, like if you can get another two points in the board from a tip point of view and have four after two games, yeah, say, yeah, say, yeah. same with Cork, you're on the back foot a yeah, small bit, yeah, yeah. both with both with a wounded Limerick to play down the line as well. So it's, um, I think that adds even more intrigue. It's just, it's a bit mad, lads, that uh, that the only way you're going to see this game is to be in the grounds, um, on Saturday, realistically, with the game not been not been televised in, you know, on terrestrial television or it's not on GA Go as well. Um, there's only a certain amount of people that can get into the grounds and for, Jesus, for the couple of hundred thousand other people that want to watch it, I think it's a bit bon- How, how I don't understand how when you're scheduling GA programming for a weekend, Tipper playing Cork in a hurling match of any description, you televise it, especially when it's a senior Munster Championship game. Um, I just can't get my head around how, how the game's not going to be broadcast in any medium. It's a, no, it's on GA Go. It's definitely on GA Go. Yeah, yeah, I just don't Okay, check. well, it should, it, should be on, it should be live on RTE. <laughs> yeah. Um, there'll, be a bit of, there'll be a bit of buffering and there'll be a few circles in the middle of the telly, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Declan, in terms of the, the Tipperary team we're seeing this year, what players have impressed you or even just the style of the team? What, what have you made of it? Well, I, I think the first thing to say about Tip is they're, they're extremely fit anyway. Um, Jake Morris is um, he's a player that can he can destroy you in ten minutes. You know we saw that down in his he seems to have added a, a little physicality to his game this year. Uh, we, we've known in Tipperary since he's underage days that he can get that he can get goals. Uh, I suppose the Michael Breen experiment at fullback has been working so far. Um, you know I think that will be further tested on. Saturday evening below on Cork, and uh, I think we have a goalie with an extremely good puck out. So, um, there, you know, there's there's a lot of positives in tip at the moment. Um, we haven't been as competitive maybe in the last couple of years as as we would like in tip. So, I think Liam is just getting to grips with the guys he has brought through from his underage management days, and uh, the guys that have been there long term. It's good to see Carl Carl Barrett back there 
fully fit again. And, uh, you know, I think he adds a bit. Great to see Johnny Ryan from Araville Rovers there as well. Johnny is the first uh, Araville Rovers, tip, that would be Tipperary Town now, uh, player to play for Tipperary since John O'Donnell. I'm pretty, I'm, I hope I'm not leaving out anyone there, but uh, John O'Donnell played back in Babs Keating's day, so that's a, that's, that's a while ago. But uh, Johnny has made his mark there, and he's, I suppose, again, he's, he's aggressive, he's tigerish, and uh, he's, a, he's the type of player that Liam likes to have on his squad. Do you see many changes for Tipperary this weekend? I mean, Connor Stakelham did very well when he came on the last day. You have the option of putting James Kennedy in the backs if you want more pace back there. Do you see him going with the same team? I think he'll go with more or less the same team, uh, bare injuries. And um, I suppose <clears throat> the game is so physical now, and we saw both Waterford and Limerick struggle to recover in the week uh, after a hugely physical game in Thurles the week before. So, you know, injuries are going to play a big part, I'd say, in the championship this year. Um, so, but, you know, I, th- I think we're all looking forward to the game. Hopefully, the weather will be decent and there'll be a good crowd. There will be a good crowd in Cork, no doubt. Uh, yeah, we met a couple of people from RTE there at the launch on Tuesday of the Dylan Kirk uh, Day for Dylan in Killarney, and um, I think they are they are as disappointed as anyone that the games aren't being shown on, on RTE. You know, it, you just wonder um, how far away from the ordinary GA supporter we're getting at the at, at the top in the GA. That's that would be a concern, I think. Mm. There's a John, comment after coming in there, Shane. I think it's worth reading out from Matthew Landy. He just says, the GA is a business now more than anything else looking at what they're doing. GA with GA go, online tickets only, etc. It's mad to think of how much money they make each match and no player makes a cent. I have to say that the idea of um, particularly elderly people that maybe don't have smartphones, how difficult it is even to get into a game now. I just think we're losing the sight of uh, losing the sight of what the GA is a small bit. And I just can't get my head around how... I, you know, this is this is this is the biggest hurling game of the weekend by a mile. We're going to be flooded by football in you know in a month or six weeks' time with this new All Ireland structure, football structure. I just can't get my head around how the game's not on RTE at the weekend. But that's where we're going, Michael. Where you know, does how it does does a new wave of people out there that that only know IT, that only know the web, that only know these devices, and you know what I mean? Like I get, I couldn't get into the ticket for a down the match in the park last Saturday and I rang my daughter I said would you ever I just can't, I just can't get into it and she fixed me up there's always somebody will will will, will look after you now but I think I've always advocated that the GA should be live streaming of matches you know what I mean and own their own rights to, to those matches rather than giving it to RT or somebody like that put put all those matches up on live streaming and and um, you know we get access to an awful lot of club matches on on live streaming as well you know, a lot of matches are just up there and uh, just matches on on this live stream. That's the way it's going. So yeah, we're probably we're probably living in a world of change at the moment, and there's there's an awful lot of change in the GA um, as regards getting matches uh, on television and going to matches and the online ticketing. Maybe it's just maybe the change is coming peaking fast at the moment, and it's difficult to keep yeah, up, and yeah, especially yeah. for people of, of a certain era. You know, it's. Yeah. It's, it's my my own father is a man there. He's eighty one years of age, and uh, he doesn't have a smartphone. But you know, I think he's typical of a lot of the um, the men that have given their lives to the GA, but they're they're finding it more difficult to get to get to the games that they want to get to now. Declan, can I just ask you? A, I'm going to put a picture up on screen here and and ask you what you, you know. What do you think of when you see this picture here yourself, Larry Corbett and Owen Kelly? It's a picture that's been trotted out many times over the years. I'm just wondering, like, what's your recollection of this and having two of the future stars of Tipperary hurling either side of you? <laughs> yeah, that was that was a picture that was taken below in Parky Cueve. Um, we were playing Clare and the two boys. I suppose I was coming to the end of my days. I was, I, if 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 Nicky Nicky was manager at the time, and I suppose if he had to be doing his job right, he'd have kicked me out the door. I'd been I'd have been gone out to grass, but. Uh, <laughs> Owen and Lar were, were young guns at the time. They were coming in, and um, I suppose I, I just felt that um, the player, the player backline at the time were very solid, very physical, uh, proper proper men playing proper championship hurling, proper monster championship hurling. And uh, I just it just so happened that uh, we came together for uh, the national anthem below that day in Cork, and. Uh, that's where that picture came out of anyway. But the two boys went on to have uh, fantastic careers. Uh, 
you know, two super one, well, I suppose both goal getters, Laren in particular, uh, top, I think he's the top scorer of goals in Tipperary Championship um, up to up to Shamie Callan there, but uh, Sharon Kelly was a phenomenal uh, man for scoring as well for Tipperary, but uh, that's a long time ago now, and uh, I don't think the jersey or the togs would fit at this stage. <laughs> <laughs> a question I want to ask you both. Um, I remember asking Aidan Ryan about this before, Declan. Um, he said him, it took him a few years to be able to adjust to not playing anymore, and he said he used to go to inter-county matches with Tip, and he'd be all fired up even though he wasn't playing. Did it take you long to adjust to not playing when you went to matches after retiring? I can rem- remember going down to Cork again and I retired after the All-Ireland final in 01 and I can remember going down to the uh, the first game Tip played in 02 in Cork again uh, and seeing that we were, we were actually going into the game and the bus passed in. It was, it was a strange experience. We actually stayed in Cork the night before and... Um, oh, I think you've hit mute by mistake there, Declan, on your on your... Phone. I'm not sure. Don't, Dec- don't, don't know if you can hear us there, unfortunately, at the yeah. moment. Declan, if you can hear me there, I think you've hit mute on the phone. Yeah. It's still muted. The, the joys of going live. Hmm? That's <laughs> live streaming, the buffer. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we'll hopefully Declan will be able to that's, back that's difficult Shane like what Declan was talking about there that's difficult I'm 66 now and you know you, you go down to the park last Sunday and, and, and you see beautiful turf you see beautiful grass like and even looking back to my own time in the 80s like and you know what I mean the pitch was still good like but uh Ah, look, you know, you, you miss the games, like, and you'd love to be out there. I'd love to be out there playing, I really would. I'd love to, you know, and have all the facilities of gyms and everything like that, and diet and nutrition, and, you know, which we didn't have in, in, in those days. Like, but uh, look, you know, they're fantastic spectacles. So I presume, John, you, anyone like that, you know, in their mid to late 30s thinking about calling it a day or, oh, will I go another year? Like, you can only play for a certain length of time. Realistically, you need to extract every ounce out of yourself yeah, because once yeah. you finish, once, you, once you're done, you're done. Yeah. Well, well, once you're done playing and that, no, I, I, I give up playing. But then I got, you know, I was coaching before I ended up playing. So I kind of kept my hands in and, and things like that. And I got involved with Cork underage teams. You know, and, and I get great enjoyment out of seeing the young lads develop and things like that. So you're still really involved, but you miss the thing yourself. Like, and, you know, fellas, I say, sure, you know, you weren't playing hurling, then there's only skullduggery and things like that. Do you know <laughs> what I mean? Because there's only hatchet men. And, you know, where, you know, I'd love to have run into one or two of them. Do you know what I mean? I'm sure Declan would love to run into one or two of the cockfellas now to see what, he, what, what he's like or they're like. Do you know what I mean? So, um, you know, and they're fantastic facilities now and, and fantastic pitches and they're well looked after with gyms, with diet, with nutrition, everything, you know. Declan, I just throw that just throw that one to you really quickly. So John talks about the facilities now and you know, better quality of hurls, better quality conditioning. People would say, looking back at hurling thirty or forty years ago, oh geez, you weren't playing hurling at all, maybe as John says, but like if you were around now, do you still do you think you just adapt to the way hurling is now and adapt to all the Level, you know, the advances in conditioning and you'd be as good as the hurlers are now. Well, I, there's some fantastic hurlers around now. I think the skill levels today are, are incredible. Uh, you know, the ball striking from the Limerick half back line is an example and some of the puck outs that are, that, that can be hit if need be hit almost to the edge of the square. Uh, I think there's great credit due to players that are playing at the top level now. They're, it's, you know, it's a lifestyle from start to finish. I don't think uh, when we were playing with we we give it that much attention and give that that much time. The when you see the physical condition of the of the guys that are talking out, you know, a couple of years ago, the horrors wouldn't have been in the same condition as the footballers. The footballers would have been physically in better condition. But you can't say that about today's players. Today's horrors at the top level, they put in they put in a phenomenal effort, and uh, you know they're they're probably majority of them are down around ten percent body body fat. Uh, which wasn't always the case in, in you know twenty years ago. But um, yeah, I tell you, it wasn't always the case. It was that you were the minority if you were below ten. Uh, 
<laughs> no, I, I think the game today is fantastic. I love watching the game. I particularly love watching a team like Limerick that can play the style of play they're playing. Uh, maybe some of the rest of us are trying to emulate it. We're not as good at it yet anyway. Whether we should revert to maybe a, a more traditional style and see if that can compete with the Limerick style of play or not, I don't know. But, um, you know, the touch, it, I've watched back games there uh, where I've seen guys going for the ball once, twice, a third time. And next thing, the ball ends up out over the line. But you don't see you see very little of that in today's game. It's majority, the majority is one touch and straight into the hand. Uh, and the score taken and the accuracy of the of today's player is is way ahead of uh, when I was certainly when I was playing. Anyhow, in terms of like the the best players you ever played with, Declan, who comes to mind when you think of the most skillful man you ever played with? The most skillful man I ever played with. Well, I suppose when, when I was younger, John Fenton was certainly the best ball striker in, in the game uh, when, I, when I was starting out. Um, as regards some of the, the best players, well, I, I, had a, I had a pretty harsh introduction anyway. Again, in Parky Cueve, in uh, my first day out in Championship, I played on Leonard Enright, who was um, a legend of the game uh, and a legend for me as a young, as a young fella. Uh, I went on then to play on, on Jim Cashman. Fergal Hartley's a player doesn't get a lot of mention there from Watford. These are all great centre-backs and full-backs of the game. And then I had the misfortune of having to play on um, Tony Keady and uh, also played on um, the great Chinese McMahon of Fair and Kieran Carey. So, uh, unfortunately, most of them outscored me in the, in, in the games I played on them, even though they were in the backs and I was in the forwards. But anyway... Um, Nick English, I suppose, was always up there in in Tipperary, and Michael Theory would and Johnny Lahey would be all hugely skillful players. And of course, the great DJ then, um, as a hurler, sure, you know, he was skill wise, he was he was lovely to watch. Yeah, who's the best player you ever played with, um, John? Or is this an obvious answer? An obvious answer, you know, Jimmy Barry would, you know, have been streets ahead of anybody. He was always, you know. A half second ahead of players and you know you, you see really really good players who have that ability like as you mentioned there about Owen Kelly and about Lark Corbett you know they, they, they're they're half a second ahead of players like but Jimmy was unbelievable I you know um really really top class player you know mm. uh Declan before we let you go do you do you see Tipperary getting out of Munster this year I think it's all to play for at the moment, and uh, you know we'll be very quickly down to knockout games. I think in in in, in Munster where to do or die, so that's certainly something to look forward to. Um, are Limerick going to be able to to get back to where they have been for the last number of years? I I, I think they're they're too good to be gone out of the championship before it gets to the All Ireland series. That's my own view. Um, they have a little bit of work to do. Um, Cork, Tipperary, Waterford, Clare, you know, the, we're all in, we're all shouting for our own our own teams, I suppose, and we're looking forward to what, what's coming down the road. And uh, the longer this year goes on now, the, the, the closer we're getting to knock out Holland. So that's certainly something I always look forward to anyhow. I think, I think Declan, like that, Waterford, Waterford have played two and lost two, so, and they're minus nine. Um, so that, you know, potentially yeah. rules them out. So it's down to four now. Um, so, yeah, yeah. you know, you know, three out of four. And that's where Saturday's match is so critical in the sense that whoever wins this match or even even a draw would suit both teams. Um, you'd have three right. or four points on, some, on Saturday night. And that's critical because Cork's two games are away to Clare and away to Limerick. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and, and um, L- Limerick have... You know, a three-week break. Sean Finn has an injury. Keen Lynch has an injury. One or two little issues. You know, one or two little discipline issues which arose in the last few weeks. So mm-hmm. there's, there's little things that come in there, Declan, that 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 would affect the team's performance. And, and I think Limerick really, really need to depend on on Keen Lynch being right and 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 on his game. Mm. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I, I think any team, if you look at any, any of the great teams down the years, and I, I, we can put Limerick in that bracket, I suppose, um, but any of them that haven't had their best 15 on the, on the field, their best 16 available, they've struggled. And, uh, you know, Limerick, I suppose, are maybe in that situation at the moment, but, you know, they have a great manager over them there. They have a great coach. I think they have a good, they have a good um, backroom team there. So 
if anyone can get it right for the right time of the year, I think it, it will be Limerick. They, we know they have the potential, but you know they're on the go a long time. This group of players, and uh, it gets to a stage where mentally maybe you don't have that energy that you need to compete at uh, you know at that high intensity level. So I think it's fan- it's it's the most interesting championship we're f- uh, time now we're facing into for for you know for the last couple of years. I think anyway. Okay, well, look, Declan, it's been brilliant to have you on the show and best uh, wishes to everyone involved in the Dylan Cork Charity Fundraiser. Yeah, and thank you to everyone for their support. Um, it has been hugely appreciated and, um, you know, we're very grateful as a community, as a family, we're very grateful to everyone that has given their support in whatever way possible. Okay, thanks very much, Declan. Thank you. Cheers, Declan. Good man. And to, to jump on to like predictions for this weekend, John, and then we wanted to ask you about Wexford Dublin if you've a little bit more time. But um, how do you think Cork and Tip will go? I mean, to be honest, I'm struggling to come up with uh, anything other than it'll be a puck of a ball. And uh, I, yeah, uh, I I think it'll be close. Um, you know, I think it'll be competitive but close. Uh, I wouldn't even rule out a draw. I think if you know if you offered both sides a draw, now they take it. Um, but we need to win this game. That's what both managers will go out and say. We need to get the two points, get to four points, and then, you know, I mean, we have a week or two weeks to start out, any little niggles, any little bumps and bruises and that, and then to go into the our respective two matches at the end, which is Clare and Tipperary, uh, or Clare and Limerick away for Cork. So both, both, both managers, both teams, look, this is massively important on Saturday night. Yeah, Adrian McGrath says Tipperary will want a very physical style to prevent Cork running at them. Will Harnady and Fitzgibbon uh, going down to get Watford players card that cause problems for Tip hurling in that way? So tasty little one there. But that that whole thing about like Tip don't want like a really open game with huge space everywhere. Like both teams like to hurl and all that, but Tipperary are struggling if Cork's pace comes into play, John. Yeah, well, the first five minutes last Sunday proved that with Fitz, he got, he got on to three balls. He put three balls over the bar. So, you know, Cork had really settled in. Um, but, like, it's it's all very well saying Tip don't want an open game. But how do you prevent that? OK, you mm-hmm. go man to man. That's if you go man to man, you're going to have to follow your forwards. You're going to have to follow. That leaves gaps behind you. And at times last Sunday, so, you know, the, the Waterford defence was wide open. You know, fellas were coming through. And that's where... Uh, you know, you mentioned Tommy O'Connell there. Tommy O'Connell will, is really good at distributing the ball and it's really good. Like Downey made a couple of sallies up the field. He got a couple of great scores. And So, look, the game is open today anyway, you know what I mean? So, uh, because everything, there's no positions anymore about who's corner forward or corner back. There are no positions anymore. It's a wide open game. We'll let the neutral man uh, throw in his spec here. What way do you think this will go, Vernie? Well, you laughed me out of the house when I said Kilkenny and Galway might be a draw last weekend. And I, I honestly think that's the most... I know it's... I think that's he the laughed most me out of the house when I said Clare beat Limerick. I don't think I did, actually. And when uh, I said that Luca Brussel would beat... Um, yeah, Bradley well, I did, I, did, I, did, I did laugh you out of the house for that. Um, I, I think it could well end up a draw. I, I find it very hard to go either way. The chance is there. There's so much at stake for both. Um, they won't play for a draw, but I think that might be. I think that could be a tasty enough option. Um, probably about eight to one or something like that. But uh, I just very, you know, when you you're looking at two teams and you're thinking, okay, Tip probably uh, capitalised on a lot of mistakes that Clare made the first day. They'll improve a hell of a lot for that two weeks later. Cork maybe weren't thoroughly tested the other day against Waterford, but they'll improve again as well. Uh, very very difficult game to call, and uh, yeah, a draw is probably where I'd be looking. And it, like. It's amazing. A draw would throw another spanner into the works, into regards points totals at the end and things like that. But both of these want to end up on four after two games. Um, that's the ideal scenario. Yeah. But I think they might yeah. both end up on three. Yeah. What's Pat Ryan like in the dress room? For like, from your knowledge, John, he I was involved with him as, in seventeen as a coach. Uh, he's very calm. Um, he's a good guy. Knows he's hurling. You know, coach stars club here in Cork. Winning counties here was involved with the under twenties. Um, was a calm guy, um, delegates responsibility to the management team, but he has good people with him as well. Donal O'Manny is with him, you know. So, look, I I think a lot is too much is made today of the manager. Um, you know, there's an awful lot of people within the back room that have have massive inputs, really quality inputs. So you see Kinner, um in in Limerick. Um, and you know, Cork have much the same setup and that, but 
the players must take more responsibility nowadays, Shane, rather than just the manager. Um, it's not about the managers, it's about the players and about you have good people working with them. Then I've always maintained that, you know, that that's really it. But Pat is solid, he's calm, gets his point across. I remember in 17 when he was the coach, uh, gets his point across, you know, goes through it meticulously. So he's a good guy. But, you know, I mean, Cal is quite similar. Um, both of them are similar type characters. Uh, I'd say on John's point there, I'd say the manager sets the tone, the players carry it on then. That's kind of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah, They see yeah, the tone yeah. that's been set by the management and yeah. the coaches and they drive it forward. All successful teams are, they're guided by the management and then they're kind of almost like self-driven thereafter, I'd say. Yeah, but but in my day, the manager was God. You know, he he was yeah. the, he ran the show. Nowadays, the manager is only just the conductor of the orchestra. That's all. He he just puts, you know, I don't know how many is in each backroom team, but like you, you have an inner core of six or seven people that you really, really trust. And it's getting those to get the best out of the players. But players today, compared to my time and Declan's time there in the 80s and that, you know, they, they, they take on more responsibility. So, there's, you know, you can't be shouting and roaring and things like that. It's a totally different uh, different preparation than, than what was there before. And, and um, you you let players take ownership of it. And, and uh, it's like what Declan said, that the skill level and all those has gone up. That's because the players have taken responsibility and ownership of it. Shane, just uh, we, and we leave the the tip cork on this. What matchups in particular are you looking forward to? Who does Barra pick up? Um, I'm just interested to see even from a cork point of view who picks up Jason Ford. There's some really really interesting battles. I'd say Jason Ford would probably be picked up by. Do you know what? It really depends on who Tipperary start. Like, do they continue with the same team as last week? And this is going to be in front of thirty five thousand people. And, I'm hoping that the Tipperary supporters show up for this one because they haven't showed up for quite as much. Uh, they will, anymore. Shane. I think, I, think the, I think the mood music has definitely changed significantly in the past 12 months. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see Damien Cahillan pick up Jason Ford. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. Like, I'm wondering, are Connor Bow and Mark Kyo going to start? You know I want them both starting. They're both energy, they're both legs, they can both run both ways, and I think Tipperary need that. And I wouldn't be against the they idea... They can run to... both ways, forwards and backwards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they go 360. Um, so I think it's very, it'd be great to see those two start. And do I think they'll start? Probably not. And um, if if Tipperary start the same team as the last day out, I think pace could will be an issue and Tipperary will be exposed at times. So in order to counter that, Tip will need to drop a lot of numbers back. And to be fair, they do flood the middle of the field a nice bit. I'd like to see Connor Stakelam starting in the middle of the field because I think Brian Roach and Dara Fitzgibbon, the two of them, are really important players. Um, I suppose Con- Cahill Barrett, Shane Barrett seems to be the one that, like, if I'm looking at the starting team the last day that I think makes the most sense, I'd be putting Rona Maher back full back on Patrick Horgan because, like, obviously Rona Maher isn't a speed merchant and I think that that would be a good matchup for him or Michael Breen because Michael Breen is very, has pretty good feet as well. Interesting think- as well. Isn't Parik Maher getting married today, actually, today. I think? Yeah, and that's funny, and he's obviously cutting his... He's not going on honeymoon, obviously, and he's going going to be at the match on Thursday, and Ronan is best man, and he'd be obviously hurling, and they'd be hoping for a similar impact that they got out, that Claire got with John Connan last Saturday, I'd say, as well, over Ronan Matter. Yeah, and you know what? I was just there going to have a quick little look at the match programme from the last day to think, all right, who else on tip? But sure, of course, you've to hey, look at the that, that's, that's gone. They're getting rid of that for this weekend. Yeah. Tipper, Tipper going back to 1-15 to 15, normal normal service resumed he just said their hand was forced a bit with it the last day um, and that they've just changed they don't want to be putting out any idea of playing mind games or dummy teams or anything like that so they'll be going but they'll be reverting back to the squad number debate is gone for a while now again yeah so like I just think Tipperary should fill the team with obviously youth and pace like I've mentioned but then the midfield or sorry middle zone we'll say I'm not saying which positions but I want to see Connor Stakeson in the team. I, thought, I think his energy and his impact, especially off, uh, off the bench the last day, we need to see it from the start this day. Um, Dan McCormick, obviously, you're going to say the Burris Lee bias, but I want to see him in there. No, I, I want... no I, to me, if you're picking any 5-12 to 12 in Tipperary, Dan McCormick has to be in that 5-12. to 12. To me, he, he offers he offers exactly what you're looking for, to me, anyway. So I'd yeah. definitely be having him in there. 
and I want to see Alan Tynan in there again. I know he wasn't, you know, outstanding the last day, but I think we've seen enough for him from him. And like, for example, in that league semi final against Limerick, fair enough, Tip didn't win it, but there was good signs there. So I, I want to see the likes of them in there. All to see, right, Cork, great. We know you're great at running. You know, if it's a track meet and you're going to be Tipperary every day of the week, but let's put a few road bumps in here and see how you go. So that's where I'd be feeling like Tipperary can do a little bit. Of, you know, cause them a little bit of bother. And I, I, don't, I think you were talking to Lean Cahill during the week as well. It looks like Craig Morgan isn't all that far away. Might take another month or so before he's right. And maybe Seamus Callan and Nilo Mara aren't too far off either. Yeah, Nilo Mara will basically feature if they get out of Munster. That was the, the kind of impression I got. Callan won't start this weekend, but potentially could feature, but will definitely feature in round three. Uh, Craig Morgan's obviously a long-term injury, but he's getting quite close. Um, and I have to say, one of the things I admire most about Liam Catton is how he just gets on with things and there's no excuses. Um, so, obviously, um, Barry Heffernan and Craig Morgan are not available for this year or it doesn't look like they're going to be available. He just got on with it. Um, and that's just his that's just his way. Um, and it's it's very admirable, I have to say. He doesn't make any excuses. But I'm just fascinated to see, yeah, uh, how can Tip... How can Tip deal with Cork's pace? And if it's a case of Tip have plenty of pace and they're able to counteract that, um, who are the better hurlers on the day? Um, it's, it's going to be yeah, it's going to be a belter of a game. As I said, I find it very very difficult to call. So I'm going to go straight down the middle. Yeah, I think Jake Morris is going to be the difference in this game, and I think Tipperary are going to win because they'll score goals. But I still think it'd be really really difficult. And question here from Connor Heaney: Will Robbie O'Flynn come in for Cork and for who? I think they sh- like if he's capable of starting. And if he's capable of playing 50 minutes or something like that, I'd definitely be starting him. Can I just say something to you as well? Um, and he obviously played the first game of the league. There's a, an increasing trend, and we talked about it on Monday, of lads not needing to play the league. Mikey Carey's back involved with Kilkenny now. Hasn't featured for Kilkenny since the all Ireland final last year and just been parachuted back in. Is this a thing of, you know, lads are just con- looking after themselves really well and conditioning themselves really well, that you can actually afford to do that? Whereas, I don't know if... 10 or 15 years ago, you could do that. Maybe lads are, have a different mentality now and they're looking after themselves that well. Look at Shane O'Donnell, look at Stephen Cluxton. Do you know what I mean? Look at TJ Reid as well. They're all just coming back in seamlessly. Um, will Robbie O'Flynn start? I think he'd start. If he's, fit to, if he's fit to start, I think he'd start. Again, he's a fairly combative type of player too that would well, offer something a bit different. If if he does start, that's who I think Kyle Barrett will pick up. Um, or, or Michael Breen. Because you could then play him inside with Hoggy, as they like to pronounce Huggy it down boy. there. Go on, Hoggy boy! And then I think Harnley would go to the half forwards. And I think they do like Declan Dalton. They like having Shane Barrett and Luke Mead for different reasons. And I think Conor Lahan could be the one to lose out there. Even though, you know, on certain days, and it's happened against Tip a few times, he can kind of light things up. Um, so, like, it, I think it's a fascinating match. And yeah. I'm very excited about this. And I I presume most of the country is pretty excited about this one in terms of, like, if they're interested in hurling. Yeah, expecting it to be high scoring as well. Expecting goals, probably five goals all told between the two teams, I'd say, as well. Um, I do agree with Adrian there. I, I don't expect Cottle to pick up uh, Shane Barrett. Why do you think that, Adrian? Why do you think Carl Barrett would be wasted on Shane Barrett? I just don't, I, I wouldn't... I wouldn't have had Shane Barrett as like as one of the leading Cork threats in the forward line, shall we say. Barrett generally goes on the one of the best forwards on the opposition team, as he did with Tony Kelly. I wouldn't be that surprised if he picked up if he picked up Patrick Corgan potentially as well. And and his pace was able to deny him an, a hell of a lot of ball. But listen, it it uh it'll be it'll be played out fairly soon. Looking forward to seeing all the different uh, aspects to it. Breen would match up well with well enough with O'Flynn, he probably match up really well with Declan Dahl tonight, say, and might be able to even beat him for pace. But it's just, it's so fascinating the moving pieces of if he plays, you're picking him up. If he doesn't play, you're picking up someone else. You know what I mean? And then you don't want to get too fixated on what they're doing. Um, because it was put to Pat Ryan that you know, a big part of Brian Roach's brief against Waterford was to pick up Jamie Barron and detail on him and he totally denied that and said no we just told him to go out and hurl and whoever was there was there that's not the whole truth but it's probably partially the truth you know okay um, Martina Hayes says is this match on RT please no it's on GA Go 